Friends, welcome to week nine of our Scattered Together worship because of COVID-19 and the shelter at home orders. As with all the weeks of this pandemic, a lot has happened. As you probably know, there was a case brought to the Wisconsin Supreme Court that challenged Governor Evers' extension of the stay at home order. On Wednesday, the court ruled that the extension of the order was illegal. That meant, at least in theory, that in a matter of minutes on Wednesday night, everything was allowed to open back up again. In practice, however, what has resulted is a lot more uncertainty. Some cities and counties are creating or extending their own restrictions. Some businesses are choosing to open while others are remaining closed or beginning a phased reopening. What's true in Outagamie County might not be true in Shawano County and might not be true in the city of Appleton. And everything is very different in Green Bay and Brown County where numbers of positive cases continue to rise. These are the words of our UCC Wisconsin Conference Minister, the Reverend Franz Riegert, from an email sent to clergy and churches on Thursday, May 14th. Quote, in consultation with the Wisconsin Council of Churches and in solidarity with our denominational partners across the state, we continue to recommend that UCC congregations not resume in-person worship or other activities in our church buildings until the public health gating requirements are met as set forth in the Badger Bounce Back Plan. Yesterday, new cases were up again, and we have not yet met the criteria for moving into phase one of the plan. Phase two would allow for gatherings of up to 50 people with social distancing and health precaution protocols in place. This will likely take several more weeks. I encourage you to continue to provide online worship services and to prepare for the eventual easing back in a hybrid fashion, incorporating both in-person and online gatherings." End quote. Well, that is exactly what your parish leadership and I were already planning. We've been communicating this week with each other about a slow return to in-person worship beginning hopefully on Sunday, May 31st. What does that mean practically for our congregations? Some form of electronic worship will continue, perhaps eventually easing into a video recording of the service from one of our churches, rotating which one over time, but at least for the moment, more like what you've been accustomed to in these weeks. If you are interested in continuing to receive pages like this in print, please be in touch with me and we'll do our best to work out a delivery. Some new things will come to our sanctuaries. There will be signs at entrances reminding people to keep social distancing six feet apart from people they don't live with, which means if you want your favorite pew, come early. Hand sanitizer will be available at every entrance to each of our sanctuaries. Disposable masks will be available at each sanctuary and, encourage, and an encouragement to please wear your own mask if you are more comfortable. No passing of the piece as we've done it before, but we'll probably wave to each other. For at least the first couple of weeks, worship will be more like what we've done in these weeks a shorter service, though we will be bringing back some of the responsive and interactive parts of worship, including the sharing of joys and concerns. No congregational singing, at least for a while. Singing has been proved to be an incredibly efficient way to spread the virus because much like coughing, we project differently when we sing. For at least a few weeks, we will listen to songs and hum along in our heads and our hearts and maybe something interactive that I recently dreamed up. Communion will be changed. Before the pandemic began, I had hoped to have communion at all three churches by intinction on May 31st for Pentecost Sunday. 
but all the advice I have says that intinction is not a safe practice. So we will put off communion until Sunday, June 7th, and then there will be changes. Currently, I am thinking that we will have pew communion with only wafers set into individual paper cups like mini cupcake wrappers. All of this prepared by someone wearing a mask and gloves and then served to you by folks who have sanitized their hands and put on gloves before serving. Only the servers will handle the elements, handing them to each person. No fellowship time that involves food or drink unless it's pre-packaged and social distancing is encouraged while people visit. And there may have to be other changes to our shared life together as we get information from scientists, public health officials, denominational and parish leadership. This pandemic has changed us. And I think we're all beginning to understand that our lives will never be the same again. That can be both a good thing and a challenging thing. The challenging part is realizing how careful we are going to, we will need to be going forward because our best scientists tell us that COVID-19 is unlikely to be the last of its kind of viruses we face. We will have to stay prepared with excellent sanitation, hand washing and disinfecting. We will have to keep our masks handy, our bottles of sanitizer full, and not forget what six feet apart looks like in case we need to do preventative distancing again. But this experience can also change us in many incredible ways. When it's all over, when there's a vaccine and better treatments for COVID-19, we can still reach out to one another. We can keep calling people, sending cards, offering to help someone pick up their groceries and praying with and for each other. We can remember the lessons we learned in isolation, how important medical care workers and grocery store employees and restaurant clerks and farmers and factory workers and teachers, school lunch workers and bus drivers truly are. We can support small businesses, shop local, keep taking walks in our neighborhoods, waving to people, sending emails and texts and videos and encouraging one another in every way we can think of. The choice is ours, my friend. Will what we have lived through together harden our hearts or open them? If we choose, and I believe we have to make a decision each and every day, sometimes two or three times a day, we can allow this time to change us for the better, softening us, expanding our minds and our creativity, opening us to the cries for justice and peace and hope in our communities, our congregations, and around the world. So for at least a few more weeks, we are together in this scattered way. Distance in body, but united in faith. Part of this week's worship is to help us remember our connections, not just to one another, but to the wider United Church of Christ, and indeed to people of faith around the world. Our conference minister, the Reverend Franz Riegert, along with his colleagues on the Council of Conference Ministers, prepared a service for us to use today. I'm including here the words of welcome, time of prayer, and the message or sermon from their service. I've added some parts from the service order we have grown used to in these last weeks for familiarity, but I wanted to include their work to remind us of our connection, of the ties of faith that bind us to one another across all kinds of differences and bring us together as God's people, dependent on each other and on God for our very being. If you would like to view the entire service from the Council of Conference Ministers, there is a link in the emailed materials. As always, I thank you for your prayers, your patience, your love, your comments and suggestions, and your encouragement in these days. A few parish announcements before we begin. As things open up again, please continue to be careful. 
hand washing, wearing masks, and distancing are among the only tools against this virus that we have, while scientists work on finding more effective and efficient treatments and a vaccine. And as things open up again, please respect the different approaches people will be taking to returning to pre-isolation activities. Some folks will go back to taverns, restaurants, shopping, church, and more quickly. Others will not. Each of us will have to make a decision for ourselves and our families based on needs, risks, and more. Be gentle and be kind. And if someone you know isn't ready to go back out again, please continue to offer to help them in whatever way you can with pickups from the grocery, the pharmacy, shopping, or a takeout meal. We have at least a few more weeks of transition from totally sheltering at home to completely reopening. These are going to be confusing and uncertain times, since rules and regulations will vary and our emotions will be all churned up. So please, keep checking on one another. We still need our connections, our lifelines during these days, perhaps in this time of gradual re-entry to the world more than before. Our volunteer drivers continue to be available if you need help with things from the grocery or the pharmacy. Our Loaves and Fishes food pantry is preparing for distribution this coming week, Wednesday the 18th and Saturday the 23rd. Your prayers for a safe and helpful distribution are greatly appreciated. And thank you again to everyone who has and continues to contribute to our work. We could not help others without you. And please remember our food pantry is here to help anyone in our parish and community who needs help meeting their food needs. Please continue to be aware of scams relating to COVID-19. There is one that, make, that sends a text message or makes a phone call warning you that someone you know has tested positive and asks for your personal and banking information. Remember, if it sounds suspicious or too good to be true, it probably is. Please continue to be gentle with yourself, particularly in these transition days moving from preventative distancing to reopening. It's going to be a bumpy and confusing time as we each seek a way forward. Be careful about how much news you are consuming and remember that hope spreads even more effectively than the virus. And it's okay to be a carrier of good things like love, kindness, compassion, and generosity. I remind you again that there are those using this virus as an excuse for hatred, bigotry, and racism against people of Asian descent and people who are different than we are. As followers of Jesus, we are called to love and trust without discrimination and to speak out against the evils of all the isms that divide us. Thank you to everyone who has sent in contributions to the church during these difficult times. Your parish leadership and I are grateful if you can continue to do so Addresses where you can send contributions are included in the email and printed materials. Mail at all three churches is being picked up at least twice a week, but if you're worried about things sitting in the mail, you can send them to my PO box, which is listed at the beginning of the printed materials. Please remember, I am only ever a phone call, text, or email away. Now, I invite you to settle in. These are hard and stressful days, and we are all carrying it in our bodies, deep in our muscles and bones, and even deeper in our souls. We can and need to relax, resting into God's loving arms, allowing ourselves to be supported by God's grace and strength. Picture yourself walking into one of our sanctuaries. Imagine that you're one of the first to arrive and the room is quiet. It's empty of people, but filled with the spirit, with the energy and love of generations of the faithful who have gathered here 
for worship. Think of those people who you loved, who loved you into life, and who gathered in these places. Find your pew and settle in. Allow yourself to take a few breaths as deeply as you are comfortable. Allow the holy air of the sanctuary to fill you body and soul. Offer up to God all your holding in your heart, the concerns and struggles, the anxieties and fears, the joys and hopes. Now imagine the doors opening and your people walking in, finding their own pews and waving to you. Imagine the church filling with your friends, your family, people you don't know well just yet, and visitors looking to know that God's love is real. Listen for the prelude music. Really listen to what it sounds like this morning and how it makes you feel comforted, excited, hopeful, filled with anticipation. Listen now as the music comes to an end. Hear the bells chiming and let us worship together. Hear these words of welcome from the Council of Conference Ministers, and then enter into a time of prayer from David Long Higgins of the Heartland Conference. Mm -hmm. Welcome. On behalf of the Council of Conference Ministers, we welcome you this day to worship. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. In the season of Eastertide, in the midst of this global pandemic, we are grieving. We're we are anxious. We experience highs and lows as we try to stay home and stay safe. We do not grieve, however, as those without hope. We have hope that the resurrected Christ will accompany us today and always. We hope in the goodness of the human community to work for the common good. So welcome today to this time of worship. May it be a blessing to you and to all of us. Welcome. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy love, like the beautiful blossom of the lily, the joy of Easter seems to fade so quickly. Its brilliance buried by the withering words of a daily digest of news and noise that seems not to care that you have reordered the world. The wonder of a world made new seems crushed by the urgency which viruses and vitriol would voice as the daily ritual of remembrance. How easy, O Holy One, to re-enter the tombs of our own making and those rooms fashioned by our fear and our fatigue. So grant us the gift of noticing that lies just beyond the fading flower of every yesterday. Refashion our focus on your surging strength, your promised power, yearning to take center stage in our lives. Like the unopened bud that awaits the beckoning power of the sun, open our hearts to your Holy Spirit already around and within us that we may be readied, renewed, and blossomed into the beauty for which you have created us in Christ all along. Yes, Holy One, renew us and your whole creation, that we may be signs of your resurrection love in word 
and work throughout the world. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. For our first song today, I have chosen God's love will hold us. Oh, how challenging these days are when everything seems unsettled and confusing, when we don't know what new changes tomorrow will bring for us, for our communities, and for the whole world. But through it all, whatever changes come into our lives, the promise of God is that we will never be alone. God's grace will guide us and God's love will hold us. That love has brought us to today through all the things we thought we could never survive, and it will surely carry us through all that comes. Our friend, Pastor Brian Sergio, wrote this song and shares it with us to remind us of God's incredible love now and always. I invite you to think about God's love holding you now in these times and seeing you through whatever the future holds. We go to Brian's video. Let us be together in prayer. Holy God, we need you, your guidance and your love, and maybe just now we are more aware of how deeply and completely we need you. 
things are changing once again, and it's hard to know what to do, how to go back to our lives in the world, how to even imagine what things will be like. But we know, oh God, that you are with us in this time, inspiring and encouraging medical professionals and researchers, including doctors, nurses, technicians, orderlies, janitors, custodians, nutrition and cafeteria workers, as they care for the sick and look for treatments and vaccines. Guiding and leading those who make decisions about our collective health, who create and carry out public policy, comforting and supporting those who worry about closed businesses, lost jobs, uncertain futures, stretched budgets. We know you are with essential workers in the grocery stores and shops who have continued to do their jobs in the face of ever-changing rules and at the risk of their own health and that of their families. With folks who are returning to work or continuing to work from home, who wonder what changes will be coming, with the farmers, farm workers, factory workers, truck drivers, utility workers, garbage collectors, firefighters, police officers, first responders, military service people, transit drivers, mail and package and food delivery workers, and emergency personnel who never stopped their work. You are with teachers, school lunch workers, bus drivers, aides and administrators wrapping up the end of a strange and uprooted school year. And with those who graduated this year whose celebrations were not what they hoped and dreamed of. And with all of us who are working to find hope and courage in these days. Remind us, O oh God, of reasons to be joyful of the sure and certain signs of the changing seasons. Help us celebrate the strength and adaptability of our congregations and our communities who are working so faithfully to stay connected and support each other. Help us, O oh God, to be in solidarity with those who struggle in body, mind, or spirit. Send your healing love to all who need it in body if that is possible, but surely help them be united and one with you in spirit. Comfort all those who mourn, O oh God, with all who are struggling with grief and loss. Be with Joe Engelbert from Trinity and his family as they grieve the death of Joe's brother, John. Be with all who mourn. Remind them and all of us of your promise of life everlasting. Guide us and give us strength that we might open our hearts and minds and spirits to your presence, your power and your grace, O oh God. Help us that we might find the peace, hope, love and grace that can never be taken from us. This and all the prayers of our hearts and minds, we pray together with the words that Jesus taught his first disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from Acts. Paul is on his second trip spreading the good news of God's love made real through the life ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. He comes to Athens, Greece, an incredibly important city in the ancient world, a center of philosophy, arts, science, and so much more. 
Paul walks around the city, noticing the many shrines and temples that have been built, and then addresses the council, sharing with them the oneness, the unity of all creation. Reading from chapter 17, verses 22 through 31, adapted from the New Revised Standard Version. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus, the council, and said, People of Athens, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at your objects of at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the one who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, as though God needed anything, since God alone gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and God allotted the times of their existence and boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps reach and find God. Though indeed God is not far from each one of us, for in God we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are God's offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that God is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent because God has fixed a day on which the world will be judged in righteousness by the one appointed. And of this, God has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing and the living of this scripture. Marilyn Kendrick of the Southern New England Conference wrote this reflection for us today, titled Things Change, God doesn't. You will hear several different voices in the video with Marilyn's message. God has indeed reordered our world. The way we were before seems so long ago, and we find ourselves living in a new reality. We have discontinued practices that we thought were unchangeable. It turns out that the God who made the world and everything in it does not live in shrines made by human hands. I can remember a Sunday practice from my childhood. Many Sundays after church, my mom and dad would load us kids up in the front and we would go for a Sunday ride. No destination in mind, daddy would just drive. Invariably, he would get lost somewhere on Long Island. In my younger years, I would cry because I was afraid that we were lost. But my dad would say, you are not lost. As long as you are with mommy and me, you can't get lost. As I grew, I came to understand that and find comfort that no matter where I was, if I were with my parents, I could never get lost. In these long weeks, when we've been cloistered in our houses, many of us have been feeling lost. We went into this time of stay safe, stay home, fearing deep in our hearts that being physically separated from our faith communities would cause us to be separated from God. Fearing that if we were not in our favorite pews, that we would not be able to find God. We thought we needed our church buildings, our beautiful sanctuaries to feel God's warmth enveloping us in love, but it turns out 
that the God who made the world and everything in it does not live in shrines made by human hands. Friends, it's not only the separation from our buildings that has us feeling off kilter. We've all been living through a nightmare, an international nightmare. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us live in fear of losing loved ones. Some of us are suffering from the virus and some of us are suffering from lost income because of the virus. Some of us are bored from too many days looking at the same walls. And some of us are forced to work at home while some of us wished we could stay home and not work endangering ourselves and our loved ones to keep essential businesses open for the rest of us. Some of us, the heroes among us, are working in hospitals and nursing homes, working as EMTs and police officers and firefighters and orderlies, many of whom are overwhelmed and overworked, trying hard to keep people alive. Some of us don't know if we can continue to watch as more and more people get sick and die. This is indeed a long national nightmare. Those people whom Paul encountered in Athens, they had some inkling that there was a God whom they did not know. Paul had observed as he walked around their city that they had objects of worship in their shrines and that among them was an altar to an unknown God. He understood that these were people hungering for an experience of the holy. And so he told them about the one true God. And he let them in on the secret that the one true God could not be confined to their temples. No, he shared with them that the one true God was not far from each of them, not far from each one of us. He let them know that in God we live and move and have our being. As Paul told them about Jesus, how he'd lived and how he died, but most importantly, he shared, he told them about how he had been resurrected. He shared with them the saving balm of the good news, that we are a resurrection people. He told them, and he is telling us still, that death does not have the final word. We are living in a time when we need to remember every day that we are a resurrection people. These are indeed hard times that we're going through. There are times when it seems as if we have been abandoned by God. But Paul is right here speaking to us from 2,000 years ago. The Apostle Paul is reminding us that no matter how bleak the time. God is still Emmanuel, God with us. He's reminding us that we are God's people and no amount of sheltering in place can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No tiny microbe can take away from us that truth that we are a resurrection people. You know, when I grew up and had children of my own, we would sometimes take those Sunday rides after church. And we would purposefully turn down streets that we'd never been on. We would jump off of the interstate uh, at an exit that we'd never taken before. This was before GPS. And we would always get lost. We grown-ups had to look to the sun for direction and keep turning until we found a familiar street or a business that let us know what town we were in. But in the back seat, our children just looked out the windows, not worried about a thing because they knew that no, they could never get lost while they were with us, their parents. Friends, we are in a difficult time right now. We feel lost and afraid afraid that nothing will ever be the same. Nothing will ever be like it was before. We've also learned so many things in this time. The most important thing we've learned is that the God who made the world and everything in it does not live in shrines made by human hands. 
We've learned that no matter what, in God, we live and move and have our being. Things may change. God doesn't. We can never get lost. We have Jesus as our guide, and God is the foundation of our lives. We have the Holy Spirit filling us with such love that it just has to spill over onto others. Things change. God doesn't. Things change. God doesn't. Things change. God doesn't. Amen. Amen. Let us be together in prayer. Holy and loving God, hold us together in these tumultuous days. Open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to you and to one another. Give us strength, faith, and courage. Let us never forget that your loving presence and your amazing grace that shelters, guides, and encourages us on every step of the journey. In faithfulness and hope, we pray. Amen. For our closing hymn today, I chose Holy, 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 written by Reginald Heber in 1826. Heber was Oxford educated, winning awards for his poetry and then entering parish ministry. In 1823, he became Bishop of Calcutta, India. He composed 57 hymns, but this pro is probably the most widely known. The hymn is set to the tune Nicaea, named after the Council of Nicaea of 325 AD that clarified much of the church's doctrine, including an understanding of the Trinity. The tune was written by John Dykes in 1861 explicitly for Heber's words. This hymn is a reminder that God comes to us to love us and know our lives in three ways, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, that we might know the comfort and courage of God's presence through all that life brings and that all creation, past, present, and future, gather to together to celebrate God's holiness, grace, and love. Once again, my friend Danita Bauer and her partner Jill Thompson offer us this recording using words from the United Methodist Hymnal.
my friends, receive this benediction. May you know the unity of our parish gathered or scattered that will see us through. May you remember God's incredible love for you is real and powerful and at work in this very moment. And may the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit give you courage and peace and hope in the days ahead. Amen. <laughs>